My name is Josephine Wood. I'm the Senior Program Officer at Euro, Euro HPC Joint Undertaking, and I'm delighted to be here uh, meeting you all physically in presence in Paris. Um, today, we're going to give you the first opportunity to see what we at the JU are doing. So this session is about showcasing our work over the coming years. We will present how the new regulation will impact our work and hopefully your work, how current and future HPC resources will be coming online across Europe, and how these resources will be accessible to users. We will talk a little bit about the upcoming JU activities and calls. I'm going to ask you to note down your questions for the end of the discussion, at the end of the session, uh, as I want to make sure that my four panelists get a chance to present to you what we are doing. And to you, gentlemen, I'd like to remind you, you've got 10 minutes each. So, with further ado, I'm delighted to present to you and someone who's very, known, very, very well known in the HPC community, our very own chair of the governing board and the deputy director general for research for technological sovereignty and innovation at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany. Dr. Herbert Seibel, Seisel, would you like to go? Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad that you're here. Again, listen to my presentation here. I already said a lot in the morning in the keynote, but uh, I want to set up a base for, the, uh, for my colleagues here uh, to go in to deeper into the question what is the new mission and what are the consequences out of that? May I have the next slide? Please? Oh, I have this. Okay. Yeah. Good, great. So the goals, it's very clear. We have to tackle global challenges. That means at the end of the day, it's not the infrastructure. It's what we are doing with that. What we reach with this infrastructure at the end of the day. Can we do something for our societies? So the projects and, of course, the outcome is the important thing and not the computers themselves or the algorithms or architecture. I think the most important thing is the outcome. And that's why we have to look to the global challenges and we have to give, of course, our major global challenges priority to that what we are doing. This is an ongoing discussion in the governing board of the EuroHPC. What is a global challenge? It's defined in a way by the uh, Council regulation, which was renewed. But it's an open story. That means uh, there, there are other global challenges up to come, and we have to discuss this. Now, right now, we have the challenge destination Earth. We have the question of climate, we have the question of pandemic, but there's several questions coming up, of course. And we have to do with our infrastructure, advanced science. Advanced science is, again, something at the end of the day is for the society. They have to have an added value why they are doing that, why we are doing that, why they are paying the money for to us. And by this, there's a third point, which is boosting industrial strength. I called this this morning sovereignty. And you see, in this time, it's very obvious that we have to do more for ourselves, that we be ensure at the end of the day, Europe can stay for itself. And to stay for itself means our industry has to be strong enough to do things what they're sometimes not doing today. During the pandemic, we learned how vulnerable our value chains are. And I think on that we have to work. And uh, one of the things of this Euro HPC is also bo boosts this industrial strength and the European Ship Act, we mentioned that this morning, is one part of that. Right of that, there's a lot of questions coming up of that, now, of course. You know, if I talk of European Ship Act, we have a uh, KDT, which is uh, responsible for microelectronics in Europe. We have quantum electronics, quantum computing. We have several initiatives. And now, 
in the new regulation for the JU, also the JU of EURHPC has some missions to do there. This is a, a, a challenge for us. And the last is ensure European digital sovereignty. I talked about that already. What is the EURHPC joint undertaking? It's a legal entity. On the, in the Article 187 of the uh, uh, treaty, how the European Union works together. And it's a public-private partnership. We had a question this morning, what is a private partnership? Uh, how is this working? What is your experience with that? A public-private partnership is nothing new. We have that since 20 years. It depends how it's working, because it relies on the communities, it relies on the, uh, on, on, on the branches, on, on the markets, and of course on the trust. For example, we have a very long ongoing public-private partnership in the area of microelectronics. I mentioned now KDT, which is uh, something you all know right now, but this comes from early years where we had Chessy in the Eureka program. And there we learned how to work together between public and private. And uh, this JU, if it will be a JU, of course, and the Commission is going in that direction, is, is of course very successful in this public-private partnership because it's a long tradition, it's, it's trained, and they gain trust. And this is something we have to do every, also here in EuroHPC. We are not there where we want to be. Our, our public-private partnership is something in the, final, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the first stage. We have to build up trust between each other. And, of course, we are a little bit more difficult than in KDT because we are not just doing just, uh, you understand what I mean, it's just uh, research projects. We have also the procurement involved. And this makes things complicated. Then we have right now in the JU joint undertaking 29 EU member states and associated countries. The union is represented by the commission and the private members. Right now we have ETP for HPC, which is a long partner in this. Long the JU is here since three years, so this is long. <laughs> Uh, but we have two new ones, Dairo, which is uh, mainly with artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence, and we Quick, which is with quantum. These are new ones because the mission and the future goals of this joint undertaking was broadened by the Council regulation. And our duty is to align the strategic this is the strategies of the states of the union and industry in this area, which is not easy because we are not talking only about EURHPC. I talked in this morning about diversity, diversity of technologies we have, diversity of, communi of, 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 of communities we have, and to bring this together to do a strategic alignment is something which is very difficult. And we have to, to learn how to do that, because the, 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 the many dimensions we have here, it's complicated to bring together. If I may, it's even for me in Germany difficult to align the strategy of the different ministries in Germany in this area. And if I see that in the joint undertaking we should try to do this, not just for Germany, but also for all participating states and the Commission, because the Commission has a, 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 a mind of its own. <laughs> I think this is complicated and we have quite some challenges here. And I talked about that. We have a new and expanded mission. We have to develop, deploy, extend and maintain a world leading supercomputing, this is not new, but now quantum computing, service and data infrastructure ecosystem. This is much more than just a, a supercomputer, it's, it's a whole infrastructure we are talking. And what's not written here is what we are doing with the question of the communication lines. 
This is an additional question we have to face. We have to su support the development of innovative supercomputer systems and of a wide range of applications. Yes, I said that at the beginning. The whole issue is about applications, about the added value for our societies. What's come out of it? And we have to widen the use of the infrastructure to a large number of public and private users. This means that we have to cooperate, we have to train, to educate, to develop key skills in science, but moreover even in industry. And this is complex because at the end of the day, it's not just the informatics to run a computer or to make an algorithm. At the end of the day, we have application programs, and these application programs have to fulfill the needs the engineers uh, and the industry people out there have to solve their problems. Beside, of course, what we are already doing is in the academic world. This gives an even more complex uh, problem to us. What are the pillars of activities? And if, before I go through them, I recommend to you, please go to the website of EuroHPC, JU. There you find all the documents, and two documents are very, very important for you. One document is the multi-annual strategic plan. This is the plan that JU has for the next seven years, what we, what the JU wants to achieve and what he plans to do in this time. You can read that. And the second is the annual strategic plan, uh, the annual work plan for the next year, which is now 2022, where you can see it even in more detail what's planned. And what are the activities? It's administration. And administration is more than administration. It's not just counting. Administration means also governance. How we talk to our colleagues in the other pillars, in microelectronics, in quantum, in AI. How we come together with GEO, with praise. How we form a uniform, a synergy, and holistic approach that the user at the end of the day has not to decide, I go to praise, I go to your HPC. Yes, the society have a problem. I go there, I get it solved. This is, at the end of the day, what we have to achieve. And this is administration also for. We have the infrastructure building. We have the federation and interconnection. I think uh, Serge had this morning a very nice uh, introduction and very nice slide on that. I will not repeat that. We have, of course, the technology. This is a part which was a little bit undercovered this morning. Our technology pillar is a quite, quite a huge one. We have the so-called EPI project. This is a European Processor Initiative. That means since four, four years we are working on a European processor. So the design is very, very straightforward and we are very, in a very good situation right now. And if you get the right foundry to build for us these, uh, these, these structures, I think we, have, we will have a European microprocessor for the HPC computer. And therefore, if I may bring the relation to the CHIP Act, that's why the CHIP Act is so important. Because up to today, we have in Europe not an own foundry to, 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 to back, as we say in Germany, the, the, the chips out from the, from the design. But with the announcement of Intel, now we will get one. And this brings us in a totally different situation if we look to sovereignty. We have the application part. And as I said, this is something we have to really uh, uh, take a lot of uh, action on that because at the end of the day, it's all about application as it is all about people. And this is the skills point. And this is a difficult point because it addresses people in different areas, in different uh, phases of their life, schools, uh, universities, workspace, and so on. So the action you have to take 
uh, must be very different because you address very different people. At the end of the day, we have to take them all on board. Otherwise, we will not get there where we want to go. And of course, we have international cooperation. We should not do anything by ourselves. But this is also a very fine line we have to go. On the one hand side, to gain sovereignty. On the other side, cooperate, cooperate and not to give up anything, uh, everything. I think this is something that GU has to really find the right path through that. What is the budget? This was already mentioned. We have the budget from the Commission, which is 3.1 billion euro. We have the participating states. They have to cover that with 50%, uh, with, uh, so also 3.1 billion. And we have the private member with 900 million euro. I think this is a good setup that at the end of the day, it ensures that we really align our strategies because if I would be Germany, I'm German, <laughs> I would of course align my strategy to get for one euro I spend, one euro from the GU. This is a very strong, a very strong uh, point here. So, this is the overarching uh, point to, uh, to the GU. I wanted to make it a little bit different than in this morning. That you not that you don't, don't hear everything twice. If you have any questions, please come back to me. And now I give over to Joe. Please, Joe. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, Herbert. And seamlessly, yes, I think so too. Thank you. Seamlessly, I'd like to hand over to my boss, Anders Jensen, the executive director of UHBC Joint Undertaking. Thank you, Joe. So, um, there's been a lot of talk this morning, uh, and rightfully so, about that HPC is bigger than the machines. It's also about the people. So I just want to take a moment, if I can figure out how to make this work. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. These are the people behind the joint undertaking, um, because it is all about the people. This is the team that's currently, um, that is currently EuroHPC joint undertaking, based in Luxembourg. We're 14 staff members, and aside from the usual suspects, which are up here on this, on, on this scene, I'm joined by Claudio, Andre, um, Pauline, and Elise, that are amongst the audience. And we're all here and deeply excited about actually being out of teams. And it's been great to be out there with all of you uh, over lunch uh, and the amount of conversations we've had. Please do not hesitate to pull any of us aside if you have any questions. And what I really, the message I really want to put forward here is, is we're a little team. This team uh, was put together under the previous regulation. Uh, you've already heard talks of the new regulation. The new regulation finally allows us to grow the team. And we are very busy doing that. We're recruiting. Uh, heavily, and if anyone is sitting out there over these coming days and thinking this could be really interesting to be part of, please do not hesitate to, again, pull one of us aside, ask whatever questions you need, follow our website, because we will be launching quite a few um, vacancy notices up there, uh, and there's an opportunity to join us in Luxembourg and to be part of the team that's going to help build the first European Exascale, for instance. Um, we're a small team. I'm very proud to say that we are, we are perfectly gently, gender balanced, um, just because it happened. Um, and as we move forward, uh, we've already recruited uh, a number of new staff that will be joining us over the coming months. And I'm very happy to say we've had spectacular applications uh, from both genders. So there's good reason to believe that we can continue what we're on here. Um, one little plea I have to say, some countries are better at sending candidates than others. So, you know, if you're, and that's not, uh, that's not any, there's all, on all the good candidates that comes from, from few countries, but there are a number of countries out there that's not represented 
uh, and I would love to see applications uh, from, from those. So just to, on, on diversity, this is how we look at the moment amongst the staff. I think, uh, I think we, 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 we tend to say, can we add a new interesting nationality to the team? It would, it would be a bonus. Um, so we're, we're already quite diverse nationally. Uh, on, on, uh. So back to our mission. Basically, uh, Herbert already covered this in, in, uh, in, in great detail, so I'm going to I'm going to skip a little quickly through the first couple of slides, uh, but just to, to note that, of course, what we are going to be doing on infrastructure, you've already heard about it. We, the next big frontier is the, the first exascale machine. That already happened. We, made, we, we went out and we, um, and we asked who wishes to host the first exascale in Europe. That happened before, uh, just before Christmas. We had the proposals back, and we're now currently evaluating that. Uh, and, and, and this is one of our big uh, projects uh, for, for this year, is to, is to get all of that um, up and started. Equally, the first quantum computers, um, unless something happens between now and tomorrow evening, the governing board should agree <laughs> that we are going to do the same for the first quantum computers in, in, in Europe. Uh, so we will go through the same process, go out and ask which hosting entities, which, which participating states uh, would like to host a Euro HPC uh, quantum computer. And then we'll get responses back, evaluate those, and then go uh, procure quantum computers and make them available in the same way as we will make the supercomputers available uh, to, to the European users. Equally, we also, before Christmas, went out and asked who wishes to host further mid-range machines. And we had a number of good applications, and we are again evaluating those, and hopefully uh, in, in an, well, hopefully by the next governing board, we'll be able to uh, announce who, uh, who will be uh, hosting f further machines. Herbert already touched on this. This is in our regulation. I'd, I'd urge you all to, to go up and, and read more. This is what we're going to be focusing our, our work on um, in and around the technology pillar. The, um, the use of European technologies uh, inside, uh, inside the machines that we're going to be building in the future is a, is a key, um, is a key um, objective. And, we need to continue to be leading on, on applications and get into artificial intelligence and, and big data. Um, but as Herbert already touched on that, I'll skip through it. Uh, uh, equally, uh, we have the skills and federation objectives that Herbert touched upon, um, which is one of, oh, maybe the, what I do want to add is we don't have all the answers right now, and that is exactly why we're here. We're gathering, uh, we're gathering feedback. We are. The way it works is the governing board, we, we set the work plan for the future. And this is, we have, a, we have an advisor group, Infrag and REAC, they will meet, we get input from that, that gets into a work program which the joint undertaking puts forward to the governing board, and the governing board then uh, hopefully agrees on it. Uh, a lot of discussion goes into that, and what you will see right now is that if you download our current work program, there are a number of placeholders, things that we, as per the regulation, want to do, we have to do, it's, it's what we were created for, but we don't have the answer yet on exactly how we're gonna do it. Uh, because basically we haven't, the time hasn't been there to consult with everyone and have the discussions. What you will see shortly, again, hoping that uh, nothing happens between now and tomorrow afternoon, is that the governing board will agree an amended work plan that already then fills in a number of placeholders and adds more work, more details on how we're going to do it. And that's how we, that's how we move the, these things forward. Um, Daniel's going to touch on our, on our, um, on our uh, advisory groups, but again, they, they, will, they, will, they, they have now been constituted and will feed into, into that very important process. Now, on the infrastructure, you've heard a lot of talk about this. This is what's already available. Uh, we touched upon it this morning. Five very, uh, very good systems out there that we are providing access to. But what's also coming still is Chinica and, uh, and Decalion and Mernostrum 5. So what that all 
add up to is a very considerable increase in the capacity that the joint undertaking will be making available to the European users uh, in the coming years. And if you, you can see we, we're starting a little small now because it's the, it, it's the petascale machines that's gone online, but soon we'll have the pre excess and then we'll go into the exascale. So we're, gonna, we're seeing a considerable, very considerable uh, capacity boost. I can't stress enough, I think the, the fact is with the energy, I think we can safely call it crisis at the moment, everyone will agree it is important that we look into how do we actually get the best, the best computing power per what we put into the systems. And that is a, that, that, basic, that goes into just about every decision that's being made within the joint undertaking. When we evaluate hosting entities, what's the power um, system around the, the data centers. When we're looking at EPI, uh, our, our uh, European process initiative is also very driven by we believe we can do things differently. We can believe we can do it uh, with, with lower power. Users, I, I will let, uh, I will let Vangelis, Vangelis talk to this, uh, the uh, access to, to the systems. He will provide you a lot more details on it. Um, and then the research and innovation agenda. Um, essentially, as it, as it looks right now, we're, we're focusing on, on uh, we're focusing in these areas. We have the technology areas um, where we've, we've had pilot systems that looks at the exascale uh, systems as, as they're coming up. So basically, we have, an, we have a couple of pilot systems, including one for quantum, um, that is currently being, uh, being, being built. And then we have, um, then we're looking at the application environment, and, and we have projects that go into even industrial codes, which is, uh, which is quite fascinating. Um, on the skills in education, I think the most important achievement, uh, the competency centers, which many of you are, are part of, um, they've been really vital, and what Daniel will also talk to is, of course, the continuation of these. Um, but also the, the master's program um, that um, we finally... Um, we, we've, we've, we were able to announce um, earlier, the, um, well, late last year, early this year, is, is a fantastic achievement. And the consortium behind that, I'm really looking forward to, to what they will be providing. So with that, I'll pass on to, uh, to you, Daniel, right? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's it's all right, say. I'll pass. You can. <laughs> Thank you, Anders. <laughs> I'm so excited. Can I introduce you to Dr. Daniel? Opalka, Head of Sector for R&I Calls at the, at the Joint Undertaking. Thank you very much. In this contribution, I would like to present to you a little bit about potential opportunities to participate in our activities. And since I don't want to just repeat what you can already read in our work program, I'll also point to a few options for participation beyond our standard application procedures, how, for example, you may get involved in our various ongoing activities. So the, I will cover primarily the research and innovation part here, and as I suppose most of the audience are already aware, the EuroHPC joint undertaking carries out strategic research and innovation. So it's not a bottom-up approach that is done by many other European initiatives, but we have a mission for which we've been set up, and with respect to research and innovation, uh, we, we can maybe summarize this to develop a European HPC ecosystem on the basis of as much European HPC technology as possible towards more strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty. This concept has its foundation in a few observations over the last years. Uh, one of them is, for, for example, that the HPC market is currently dominated primarily by suppliers outside Europe, while we have a fairly prominent position regarding HPC applications and also a strong HPC user community that has a very high demand for HPC resources. So in other words, if we wish to keep 
using keep this leading position in applications, we should probably make an effort to also shape the future HPC systems which are being used to run these applications. So, as has been mentioned a few times already, the European UIHPC joint undertaking is a team of several partners, five groups of partners, ETP for HPC, our private partners, uh, BDVA, a Big Data Value Association, now known under the name of DIRO, as well as the Quantum uh, Association, Quantum Industrial Association. Among our public members, we have the European Commission and currently 31 participating states. Now you may wonder how, this, how these different part, quite different partners work together and how they combine their expertise and one way to do this in a strategic way is through the current setup that we have just implemented and this is participation in our advisory board. So this illustrates a bit how the public and the private partners interact to develop the multi-annual strategic program of the joint undertaking. We have an industrial and scientific advisory board that prepares the multi-annual strategic program. Those members are being appointed by the European Commission and the participating states and specifically for the research and innovation part, all the private members, the industry associations, appoint representatives that contribute to this exercise and ensure that the research and innovation program addresses also the requirements of the European industry. So this appointment has just happened a few days ago by the EuroHPC governing board and we will send invitations to the appointed members very soon for the first meeting. Now, if we look at the at research and innovation at the EuroHPC joint undertaking, then we are basically talking about the future about the future of supercomputing. And designing and financing by, in the end the future of supercomputing is a complex, a complex uh, challenge. It requires not just producing fast supercomputers, but it requires investments along the entire supply chain, along the entire HPC value chain. And as it indicated here in this figure that I've taken from a study from the European Investment Bank, already four years old. Uh, there are a number, of, uh, a, a number of actors involved. For example, chip technology, manufacturing technology, up to the HPC customers and user base. And excelling in one of these areas will not be sufficient to be successful. So having fast applications, but not the hardware, or very fast hardware, but it doesn't serve the requirements of the users, will not help us in the end. And what you also can see here is that the European footprint in chip manufacturing technologies, or chip technologies in general, is relatively low. And this will presumably change in the future, also due to the European Chips Act that has been announced very recently. Now, these, it, this HPC value chain that we need to support maps into our strategic research and innovation activities according to what I call four areas of intervention that depend on each other and interact with each other. At the very bottom, this is the hardware. So we need more European hardware perhaps open hardware, an ecosystem for low-power, high-end general-purpose processes and accelerators. And the EURHPC has already launched a few activities in this direction. One example is the European Process Initiative, but also a number of pilot systems, and I will, I will speak about those in uh, the following slides. Equally important is also software. And here, the European uh, software stack is one of the initiatives that has already been proposed 
although there are no details yet, and this is, some, this is ongoing work, this needs to be closely aligned with the hardware development, this is certainly one of the major areas of the JU's activities in the future. To design software to efficiently use supercomputing systems, heterogeneous architectures to support hardware that is being developed. And also, towards the upper layer, support applications as efficient as possible. Now, applications, and here, Europe has a, general, a relatively strong position, and this is perhaps best illustrated by the Centers of Excellence. This is a major flagship initiative launched by the European Commission maybe 10 years ago, and we are now preparing the third generation of these initiatives. So application is also one of the key areas of our activities. And finally, at the very top, the user community to better support our users through a number of flagship projects as well. One of them is the competence centers. Also here, we are currently preparing the second generation of this initiative, and I will, I will tell a bit more about this. What's important for us, also because of the setup of the EuroHPC joint undertaking as a public-private partnership, to ensure that these activities are aligned with the requirements, for example, of the labor market and our private partners. So let me start saying a few more words on hardware and software, which is summarized more or less in our technology pillar of activities in the Euro HPC regulation. Here we already have a number of ongoing activities, and I would just like to mention three pilots for the next generation of European supercomputers. Perhaps one of the most prominent is UPEX that will use or will demonstrate for the first time the European processor that has been developed in the European Processor Initiative. And this is also already one way where advanced users may wish to participate in our activities without going through our published calls. This initiative <clears throat> will also offer an early access program for organizations that are not part of the UPEX program, of the UPEX consortium. So this is one of the opportunities to become more acquainted with the future European supercomputers. There's another important pilot launched at the same time, the, the EU pilot, which intends to demonstrate the European accelerator. This is a technology developed also within the European, the European Processor Initiative on the basis of an open of an open standard, the RISC-V instruction set architecture. And also here, since this is an open technology, it's an open, much of, this, of the developments are under an open, available under an open license. There are plenty of opportunities to contribute. So the last, the third pilot I would like to mention is the project HPCQS. This will be the first quantum computer quantum simulator that the EuroHPC joint undertaking will, prov will uh, provide or procure. And also in this case, even though it is not a system owned by the EuroHPC joint undertaking, 50% of the available compute time on the quantum simulator will be made available to European users through a peer review process. So also here there, is an op there will be an opportunity in a few years to become acquainted with the next, uh, with the upcoming quantum, quantum computing infrastructure. And the last point, this is a, bit, a little bit of a looking into the future. The Euro HPC joint undertaking is currently preparing a call for expression of interest for hosting entities to, to host our future quantum infrastructure, and you can expect this to be launched very soon. Now, opportunities for participation also exist in the area of applications, and I mentioned already the, one of the flagship 
projects in the European Union in this regard, the centers of excellence. And we have currently a call open on the next generation of centers of excellence for HPC applications that will close by the 6th of April. In this case, the initiative will address two somewhat different aspects of the challenge to develop an ecosystem around HPC applications for the exascale area. And the first is focuses strictly on the exascale, uh, on the exascale capabilities, whereas in the second topic, a more community focused, community centers approach is pursued. Finally, this is something new and it is, it will be quite different from our strategic research and innovation activities that follow more a top-down procedure with well-defined topics. We plan to launch a call on new algorithms for applications on European exascale computers. This will be a bottom-up approach with a relatively open topic and a focus on impact. So, a speaker today in the morning already said we need to make sure that our applications in the future will be more powerful, reduce time to solution, and be more energy efficient. And this is what we would like to address here. So, we have currently also a situation that energy awareness is not represented in the scientific merit system. So, how energy efficient is a scientific problem solved? Only the result counts, and perhaps this is an opportunity to reflect a bit that energy matters and is not, because, or not only because of cost. So you can expect this call to be launched also in the next few weeks. And coming to perhaps one of the most sustainable investments in HPC. This is the investment in skills of the European users of HPC. And here we already have a number of ongoing activities that are, of course, open for participation. Perhaps most prominent, our set network of national competence centers for high performance computing. And you can see it in the, on the map. It covers pretty much all of Europe and even beyond. This is an initiative that was very much successful and we see already the impact of the national competence centers when we look at other calls where we support small and medium-sized enterprises with grants that the most successful applicants are coming from the, from the network of competence centers. So this turned out to be, at least from our perspective, a quite successful initiative and we plan to continue this beyond 2023 and we will also in the next few weeks hopefully open a call for the next generation of these initiatives. In this next call we will try to strengthen the focus of the national competence centers on activities where the local support will be most efficient and effective, focusing on SMEs for example on regional HPC stakeholders but also at the same time strengthen the European network between the national competence centers so that in every country, in every region, there is access to European competence in high performance computing. So this is one major initiative on, HPC, on use and skills in HPC, but it's not all of it. Another very prominent project that has just started at the beginning of this year is the European Master Program in High Performance Computing. This has also been mentioned already today in the morning, and I just want, to, and it will be further discussed in a session uh, on Wednesday. So if you're interested, please join us for this discussion and meet the consortium that is going to implement together with more partners uh, this this curriculum. So the idea here is to design a common European master reference curriculum in high performance computing and its implementation in a pilot program. 
It will catalyze also the HPC adoption by educating the next generation of HPC talents for industry, academia, and entrepreneurship. So this program is special in a number of aspects. First of all, it's going to be a modular curriculum that can be also adopted in other degree programs by other universities. It will be open to European universities and it will also, because of the participation of our industrial partners, make, ensure that the skills and the content of the curriculum will align with the requirements of the labor market. So we believe that this will give the students that graduate from this program with a multiple or a joint degree an excellent career perspective in HPC. So the, there are not many students present here, I understand, but applications are still open until 15th of May, and we hope that we will see an excellent intake of talents. Now, a last point on participation. So some of you may have followed the discussion on the user forum earlier today. And in fact, the Euro HPC joint undertaking has also preliminary plans to launch a user forum initiative. The idea here is not to, not necessarily or not only to reach out to users that are already regular users of our HPC infrastructure, but also to understand what it needs, how the infrastructure needs to be designed in terms of systems, in terms of configuration, in terms of support, to attract new user communities, for example, from the industry, but also from other disciplines that are underrepresented in our current HPC ecosystem. It will also support a de demand-oriented and user-driven HPC ecosystem by providing feedback to, to us as the implementing body, but also to our policy makers. So this is an opportunity, I believe, which, is, which can have great value and uh, offer a, an excellent opportunity for participation and for influencing our activities. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and back to you, Joe. Thank you, Daniel. So after that uh, very, well, long but good summary of all our different activities on the RNI course, I'd like to introduce a well-known figure in the community, Vangelis Flores, who's the head of sector responsible for HPC infrastructure at the JU, to give you an update on his world, his world. So, good afternoon all. So this will be a presentation mostly about our systems, our supercomputers. There is also some points about access, but this morning our good colleagues from Praise covered extensively the access opportunities, but we can uh, revisit some key points also in this presentation. So, um, quickly starting, this is our European HPC uh, ecosystem. It's uh, eight hosting entities selected uh, by the JU and uh, assigned responsibility to host uh, the eight systems that uh, we procure together. Uh, three pre scale systems installed or planned to install in uh, Barcelona, in BSC, uh, in Bologna by Cineca, and Canyani by CSC. And uh, five petascale systems, smaller systems, which are either already installed or being installed in Portugal, uh, in uh, Luxembourg, Czech Republic, Slovenia, and Bulgaria. Uh, these three pre scale systems, as we say, uh, they are owned by the JU. They are the most... Uh, uh, advanced, powerful supercomputers. Uh, when we were started the process of procuring them, pro procuring them we set uh, a limit of at least 150 petaflops for, uh, for all of them, and in the end, it, we will surpass this 
by large. And the five beta scale systems that they are complementing the, the ecosystem are within the range of four to 12 petaflops. Now, out, out of these systems, uh, seven uh, are un under contract. Five of them are already uh, operational or partially operational. I will show you the details in the upcoming slides. There is one, one procurement still pending, but we're still we are pushing forward for that in order to be completed also uh, the process, uh, at least of the contract this year. And this one is for Marin Austin 5 to be installed in uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. The total contract value of, of all the systems that we have procured so far is around 360 million euro with a EU participation of 163 million. And this is without uh, the final system for Marinus 5, which has an estimated budget of around 150 million euro. Now, from the systems, but, uh, they are actually operational, some more technical details about each one of them. Now, I will not go through one by one and to explain you what it is contained inside. Um, these four systems are Viga in uh, Slovenia, Meluxina in Luxembourg, Carolina in Czech Republic, and Discovery in Bulgaria. Uh, the first system actually that went operational was Viga. Back in, uh, in March, it was accepted and was put for, uh, for operational in uh, April, May. Um, now, these are state-of-the-art systems, of course. The, most of them exhibit uh, modular architecture. Uh, they offer multiple partitions, GPU, CPU. Uh, this is the case, for example, for Viga, Meluxina, Carolina. Discovery is the only, let's say, monolithic system that we have, but this is also a quite uh, interesting and important system because it offers the, the biggest CPU-only partition uh, among all the JU systems. Uh, in, in terms of technologies, all of them rely on uh, AMD CPUs at this moment, which uh, at this period of time offered uh, the most advantage uh, performance and characteristics uh, for uh, systems of, of this scale and purpose. Um, the systems that they offer also GPU partitions rely on NVIDIA A100 chips. So, I mean, there is a homogeneity there, which means that uh, applications can effectively um, run in one system and then switch to another one if it's needed. We can uh, allocate resources from uh, one system to another. In terms of, of, of top 500, our most uh, powerful system so far is uh, Meluxina, uh, which uh, aggregates uh, performance of 12.8 petaflops. Uh, the GPU partition is the most uh, the, the, the most powerful at this point in the GU of around 10.8, uh, uh, I think, petaflops. Um, all these systems, they offer different kinds of services also. It's not only access to CPU and GPU for computing. Uh, they implement uh, cloud computing technologies. They have partitions dedicated for cloud, uh, for containers. Uh, Meluxina even offers a partition with FPGAs, uh, that people can access. Now, not all these characteristics, you will find them in our uh, uh, announcements for the calls for access in, uh, in the resources, but these are available and can be discussed and allocated uh, upon a request based on a specific requirements and can be decided case per case. For uh, the pre scale systems, we, the first one coming will be Lumi, which will be the most powerful system uh, within the whole JU. So far, we have put in operation the CPU-only part of Lumi. This is Lumi C, uh, with a performance of uh, 6.3 petaflops. Uh, it's a, quite a, a big partition of uh, 1,500 last nodes. Uh, this also relies on uh, AMD EPIC uh, technologies. Now the whole system is a Cray EX uh, system from Hewlett Packard. Um, it incorporates uh, lots of different partitions, um, uh, different uh, offerings for, uh, for storage, fast storage, 
uh, to, to, to satisfy all kinds of requirements uh, for, the, for the applications. Storage capacity up to 117 petabytes. Uh, the GPU partition, as you will see, I have a timeline later, uh, is currently being uh, installed. The first racks are being shipped, have been shipped previous week, and they are currently under installation. And uh, we're, we're hoping to have the first runs of HPL uh, by May in order to submit them to top 500 for IEC. And uh, the system should be operational after, after summer and should be offering resources to our access calls. Uh, and this is the timeline overviewing how the, the whole uh, implementation of the infrastructure part has uh, progressed, starting with the first system in March, which was Viga, uh, followed by Meloxina, Discoverer, Carolina in July, and Lumisi became operational just the end of uh, this October. And uh, for the upcoming remaining uh, partitions and systems, LumiG, as I said, should be uh, finalized and operational by uh, end of August, beginning of September. Uh, same period also Ducalion, which is the system in, uh, in Portugal, should be getting online. And finally, Leonardo, should also be uh, becoming operational by the end of this year. And I have put also Mario Nostrum 5 there after really quite a long time. Uh, if all goes well, the first partitions of, uh, of Mario Nostrum 5 should be becoming operational in quarter 1, 2023. In this slide also I have put it all the information about uh, the, the aggregated performance and the, the, the scores in the top 500. Uh, in the first uh, installation. So you may find all this information there. Now coming to, to the access policy and how you people can actually access and use the systems. So we had a very nice detailed presentation this morning. Uh, I don't need to go through it uh, in, in detail again. Just to remind that uh, the, the document, the formal document that uh, guides how the, 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 the resources are offered to the users is the access policy, which uh, uh, has been adopted by the USPC governing board. This has been developed in close collaboration with uh, PRAISE. And uh, also PRAISE, of course, is helping us with the implementation of this access policy. Uh, we have taken in, into consideration all the experience that PRAISE has developed all these years with their access modes, uh, but tried also to, to expand them a bit and to uh, to adapt them for the requirements and the ma mandate of the JU. What is important is that uh, the access that we provide is for free to all the uh, communities, to users from academia, re academia, research, from the private se sector, industry, and also the public sector. Um, there are six access modes that we have defined. You saw them in the morning. Extreme scale and regular access are the peer review based access modes. Regular, uh, the development and benchmark are lightweight processes in order to allow people to get quickly access to the systems and to develop and benchmark their applications. We foresee also fast track access for uh, applications that already had uh, run and they have a uh, uh, delivered results and they will just want quick access for some additional experiments. Uh, we foresee opportunities for urgent and emergency computing as well as uh, for strategic initiatives and projects that uh, uh, the, the process there uh, relies on the decision of the governing board on uh, how the allocations will be made. Uh, the regular access call is the, one, the only one that we are currently running. Um, it's open for applications to science, industry, and public sector. We implement three separate tracks, uh, and th this is important. The, the, the key goal of the JU is to give the opportunity also for the industry, SMEs, and the public sector to get access to high-end machines for supercomputing applications. That's why we don't put all this in the same bucket. We don't use the same criteria to evaluate them, uh, but there are uh, different criteria, different tracks, and allocation of specific uh, access time in order not to, to, to have competition between these three different domains. And um, 
That's why also the evaluation criteria are uh, slightly different uh, for each track. Now, as you saw in the morning, there are three criteria that we use to evaluate the applications, excellence, innovation and impact, and quality and efficiency of the implementation. Now, if you are familiar with, uh, with uh, grants, proposals for EU-funded projects, you will realize that it's exactly the same criteria, and this is not a coincidence. Uh, the, uh, the requirement from the regulation is that for the access policy, we need to follow Horizon 2020 rules and conditions, and this is what is reflected here. Of course, all these criteria ha have been adapted for, for a specific case that we are allocating access to systems, not to actual funds. Uh, as we mentioned in the morning, uh, the, for the scientific track, excellence, meaning scientific excellence, is the uh, dominant criterion we use to, to rank the, uh, the proposals. Uh, for industry and the public sector, it is innovation and impact. I mean, it might be not uh, state-of-the-art science that is introduced by these uh, applications, but uh, if they are innovative and they... Uh, uh, introduce considerable uh, societal impact, for, for example, then they are getting higher marks and higher priority to access our systems. Um, these were the resources that were allocated in the first uh, regular cutoff, of the regular, uh, regular access cutoff. Um, so the, essentially, these are all the partitions for these five uh, systems that are currently available. The total amount of core hours uh, that we awarded in this first call is uh, 350 million. Uh, we have not concluded a, a yet the, the evaluation process. We are in the, really in the last stage before sending the, the, the responses to the applicants. That's why I cannot reveal too many information about the, the number of applications that taught the in countries and so of uh, in uh, the scientific domains. But overall, we received 19 applications for the, this first cutoff, which is quite a modest number. But uh, it was a good start to, to try a bit of the process. And of course, we are looking to, to increase this number and also we rely on uh, people's, uh, the word of mouth, to, to disseminate these opportunities among the community, so in order to increase the availability. Uh, all these uh, access modes, they are offered, we say they are continuously open. This means that uh, at every moment, uh, any interested user may submit an application. Of course, this, this, this doesn't mean that the application will be evaluated Immediately, uh, we need to wait in the cutoff dates where in the batch mode all these applications are grouped together and they are then passed through evaluation. For the regular access, this is every four months. For the extreme scale access, this will be every six months. And for the development and, and the benchmark access, this is done every month, at the end of every, every month. Um, this is our tentative schedule of, uh, of the calls for uh, this year and the beginning of next year. So for the regular access, you saw also this morning what are the expected dates. Now, I have introduced here also the calls for the extreme scale access. This, this mode will be dedicated for the pre access scale systems, you know, for the high scalability applications. Of course, since we don't have actually pre access scale system, we cannot have extreme scale call yet. But uh, having in mind that uh, by September, Lumi G should be there. So we're planning to, 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 to have the first cut off of for the extreme scale around at some point in the summer, and then to periodically start at the beginning of uh, its year and in the middle of its year to have the, the cut off for the extreme scale calls. And I think this is my last slide. And just to add that also together with us, we have representatives from our hosting entities hosting uh, the, the pre scale systems that uh, also are available to answer to any questions related with infrastructure. In particular, we have uh, Sergio Girona from BSC, uh, Gabriele Scipione from uh, Cineca, and uh, Frederick Robertson representing CSC that also are available and they are together with us today. So that's it for me. Thank you. Vangelis, thank you very much. Can you have a little bit of Vangelis? And thank you very much for sitting through and listening to us. We've now made our pitch for what we're doing and we're open for questions.
Can I see any hands up? Please wave very, very high. Ah, there's a hand over there. Get the, gentleman, the gentleman in the check shirt up there. Hello. Hello. Um, I work in HPC since 15 years. First in roles of doing my own research, then supporting the HPC research of others. And I observed that many of the basic tools which are being used in HPC, so foundational libraries like MPI, linear algebra libraries, or high-level packages for solving complex problems, or even programming languages and their standardization efforts often come from organizations which are based in the US or are not really something that you can call under the head of European sovereignty efforts. I'm speaking of, about software here. Um, and it's, I fail to see how we, using mostly open source and free software coming from these entities, I fail to see how we can, let's say, give back some of the functionality improvement or know-how we can get back and, and get this way more value for us this way. Um, I've, okay. and, and I, I'm not in the organizational details of HPC, so of resources across Europe, so I'm asking you if, if you think this is doable somehow in Europe. Okay. So this long time efforts in software development. Who would like to take that question? Daniel, here, that's yours. <laughs> Okay. So <clears throat> let me answer this in the following way. So standardization requires effort. Uh, this takes a lot of time, participants or individuals contributing to designing standards need to spend a lot of effort. The, their employers need to agree with this. It's also in many cases <clears throat> linked to private companies, for those this is real costs, if their most qualified staff spends time in standardization bodies. And I think here we simply need more participation, specifically from our private partners. And I can give you another example that is very challenging for us, where we also suffer from the lack of participation, and this is, for example, uh, for among our experts and evaluators. It is very difficult to find motivated, uh, motivated evaluators, experts that assist us in the evaluation from the private sector. So we try to improve the situation. If you look in our calls, you will find that standardization is usually mentioned in the, in the description of the action, perhaps even in the evaluation, is, is perhaps even part of the evaluation criteria but I agree so far we haven't been particularly successful on this. Any more? Anyone else want to comment on the wider question? No? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a hand there and a hand there. So, so you've, I've got you. Don't worry. The gentleman with the, the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much for the um, presentations and the explanation on the EuroHPC. I'm working on Destination Earth um, as a digital technology leader at ECMWF, and I just wanted to ask, um, this, these initiatives come with their own procurement processes and their own kind of financial uh, implications and, and dependencies, and, and how do you safeguard that um, EuroHPC can provide the resources when emergencies happen and so on, and, and, and what is sort of the, the strategy basically for this to, um, to move forward? Could you um, give a bit more information on this? Anders? Oh yeah, okay, we, we 
have multiple microphones. So um, this, is this, this is actually something that's being debated uh, right now. Uh, we, are, we are hopefully putting the final touches on the spe special access policy uh, on, because the regulation foresees access to systems for uh, projects of uh, strategic that are being marked as being strategic for, for the union. Um, we're in the final process of, of, uh, of that. It's been discussed in the governing board and, uh, and hopefully uh, we will be able to, to finalize that very shortly. The aim, of course, is to say, look, the projects that have been recognized uh, as that will get access to a portion of the uh, JU's uh, access time. Um, this is well defined in the regulation. Um, and uh, so what we're putting together now are the, are the processes for that. Thank you. I see Derek up there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is it, yeah, it's working. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I have, uh, I guess, a geopolitical question. Um, so, uh, as you may know, I'm based in the UK. <laughs> um, and, of course, we can apply for cycles on your HPC, um, but we can't take part in the projects. And um, because we have a bit of a weird government, in case people haven't noticed, um, <laughs> So if we join in your HPC project, and not only do we not get funding, we can't actually collaborate with the, those consortia. So we can't share open source code. I can't be part of meetings. I can't share my expertise with others. Uh, I can't advise them informally or formally. I'm completely barred from any proposal that is funded by your HPC. At the same time, I can access cycles at the supercomputer like any other partner in your HPC, including all those governments that do invest in your HPC. Now, in my personal opinion, it's, it's just inconsistent. And of course, I can't, well, I could try to change the government, but that's a lot of work. But the thing is, what is more important is I understand the sentiment that you want to protect certain things. Like, for example, you don't want a technology lock-in with countries that you don't necessarily trust in terms of hardware. So I, I can understand there's some necess necessity for protection of intellectual property or certain advances, but at the same time, there are many external countries, many external parties that are happy to collaborate, that very often operate openly, and I, I've, I do not clearly see the rationale for shutting the door on those kind of initiatives. And I also wonder whether this sort of protective wall around the type of innovation, whether that should count for all co other countries in the world outside of your HPC, or whether it's perhaps more sensible to have a sort of a, a, a two or three tier system where some countries are, are trusted a little bit more than others. It's a lot of questions piled on top of each other, but perhaps uh, yeah, you can enlighten on one of them. <laughs> Don't get me started on that point, <laughs> but I won't answer it. I think, uh, and you can tell from my accent where I used to come from. Who would like to take this question? Thank you. So I think it's a question to me uh, where it's difficult for me to answer. There's a simple answer starting with, please ask your government to, uh, uh, to negotiate with us. <laughs> this will help <laughs> as long as they are not ne negotiation and uh, doing no negotiations with us. Uh, it's a problem, of course. Uh, secondly, it's very clear we want to have our own European supercomputer ecosystem. This includes hardware, software, and of course the applications. And as the gentleman over there described earlier, right now we have a situation where we use a lot of foreign knowledge, a lot of foreign technologies. So we have, of course, in a way uh, to open because we are in a starting phase to catch up. So we have to use HP from other countries. Uh, but for our research projects we are doing, we're trying to, to do this in our close job because at the end of the day we want to catch up. We want to have our own system. And it's not that we mistrust UK, but as long as you have no negotiations, where you have clear rules, how you deal with IPs, things like that, then it's difficult to open up. It has nothing to do with UK because it's UK or it's with Brexit. It's just because we have no 
rules between each other, so how we protect uh, and we deal with questions of IP, for example. And this has to be solved before, and this is a crazy situation. I totally agree with you. I hate that. It's, it's, it, it's not only in HPC. I'm also in Germany responsible for quantum technology. There it's even worse. Uh, so, but uh, that's the situation that it is. I think, first of all, we have to have an agreement how we protect IP, how we deal with IP. Otherwise, we cannot go for, forward on that. That's so simple and so worse as it is. And just to build on that, it's a simple question, simple answer is if the United Kingdom or other countries want to be part of the Digital Europe Programme and Horizon Europe, all they have to do is sign the association agreement. And then they'd be part of the club and you would have access to all these calls. Okay, yeah, I have a very small follow-up uh, comment on that because in some application domains, um, the shielding is simply not happening, right? So if I look at astrophysics, Many application astrophysics are open source, uh, collaborators worldwide use these codes. High energy physics, uh, same story. I think in meteorology, same story. I was at a meeting with UNHCR a couple of uh, months ago, and there two days even said with conflict-driven migration, the only way you can do it is to do it globally open because um, you, all the relevant organizations on the ground need to be able to use these kind of technologies. Um, that being said, I do understand your point, but I guess it, what is really important then is to identify which kind of application domains have this kind of global openness. And I think there needs to be some kind of recognition because the problem is that if you start to impose walls in application domains that are otherwise globally open, um, you're actually imposing a very unhealthy mentality and a very unhealthy uh, dynamic in what is otherwise an open research community. I, I totally, I totally understand what uh, and that you are upset on that, and I'm as well. Mm. Really, I, uh, I I totally feel with you, and I think this is a very sad and, and crazy situation. But I ask you, please, do not blame the JU, because the JU has no autonomy in this question. We have a major, um, major. Uh, yeah. uh, Gesellschaft, what is that? Uh, society? Uh, no, not society, uh, Gesellschaft. Uh, we have a ma major stakeholder having 50% of the stakes of this JU, and this stakeholders have a very different opinion on that. Okay, noted. Thank, thank you. you, but thank you for raising the question because it does come up a lot. Um, any other questions? Yes, hi. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Oh, there you know. are, sorry. Oh, there, there sorry. Who is I can't see you. Wave. Okay, there you are. Please, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Igor Karen. I'm the CEO of uh, Lighton. Um, we have uh, seen uh, a lot of good things, and one of the things I really appreciate in the uh, presentations were some of the programs that we're looking at bottom-up uh, type of ideas that would be bubbling up to the uh, Euro HPC uh, uh, decision-making. Um, so this was for software. Uh, are there, I mean, in light of the questioning with regard to the hardware, are there, besides the quantum computing, which is much down the road in terms of uh, use and everything. Is there something that is middle ground between what is currently available in terms of hardware and the future of quantum? And well, is there something in between that is more bottom up that essentially uh, tries to look at other technologies than just digital electronics to, to get to the bottom of some of those uh, uh, problems that uh, your HPC is trying to solve. Who would like to take this, this one? Okay. It's on, just yeah. talk. So I understand <clears throat> there are basically two questions. So first of all, whether we may adopt a more bottom-up approach in future activities. And the second part of the question, I understand whether we would be willing to invest in other technologies than quantum and traditional HPC. So, 
Currently, we do not have other, uh, other actions in our work program. However, I understand that the JU in principle is open also to other emerging technologies. This could potentially be neuromorphic computing or potentially something else, although there are no specific uh, plans in this direction yet. Now, so your second question regarding the bottom-up approach, this will almost certainly remain very exceptional in the joint undertaking, simply because the JU is set up to deliver technology and, to, and the bottom-up research is covered by other major European initiatives. The European Research Council receives most of the Horizon Europe uh, funding, for example. It, this is pure bottom-up approach. So uh, for this type of activities, I have to refer to these, to these dedicated initiatives. Let me explain this a little bit more in depth. I think we have a clear mission. This is, the mission is we have to support diversity also in technology. And that means we have to look also to other areas, not just to quantum computing, for example. Right now, we have not written down what we are doing exactly there. The reason is that our advisory boards are now just starting working. That means, of course, uh, we first have to hear our advisory boards, what they want that we're doing and what they give us an advice on, in which direction we should go on. And if you look to our multi-annual strategic plan, you see that we have some areas, as you see, uh, placeholders, where we knew that we want to do something in that direction. We have to do because of our mission, but it's not defined yet, because it's defined also with the community. So it's not a really bottom-up or top-down approach. Of course it's top-down because we have achieved, we have a mission to fulfill. But how to fulfill this mission is a bottom-up approach. By the uh, advisors we have, they give us advice in which direction. And this is, these are not politicians, these are scientists, these are, uh, uh, these are uh, researchers from industry uh, and industry. So therefore, uh, we are not saying this is the way we have to go. We make a, a request to the community. What do you think it's the right way to go? And then we put it in forward. So that's why Daniel cannot give you the answer exactly what we want to do in that direction. We will do something, but first of all, we want to listen to our advisors. Thank you. Oh, Anders. I was just going to say, maybe one way for you to influence that is to join one of the three private partners that are uh, contributing to our research agenda and, and is part of the advisory groups. Thank you. Now, I know there's a speaker there, but there's also a speaker there, and now I'm going to play the gender card. I'm sorry, Fab. So, please, you have the last question. We have five minutes left. Thank you very much. Very much. Well, I have three practical questions, but you can omit some of them and just answer one. So first of all, we have center of excellences, we have national competence centers, now a project coming with uh, working for algorithms. Is there any decision to give these initiatives a special type of allocation to the systems that they can work on this software? Because center of excellences, for example, do not work on industrial software so much, and national competencies do not cover what Central of Excellence covers. So do we have a possibility to give, like praise did for Central of Excellence, 10% or so to these initiatives? So, so as I alluded to earlier, the, there's discussion right now on the, on the concept that's in our regulation, which is the, the strategic projects and, and special access. That allocates 10% of the JU time to uh, any th to, to what, what is deemed to fall into that category. Definite, the next discussion becomes, so what is, what, what constitutes a strategic project? And sense of excellence could definitely be one uh, possibility. That has yet to be discussed. That is with the governing board uh, at, at, that we will have that discussion. I think the, we can only use the cycles once, so what goes to one area doesn't go to another area. Uh, so so that, that's the balance we need to, we need to strike. Uh, the other thing I would say is 
we, we, we could also take input on how we could uh, further make it easier to apply for access via the access policy. After all, that's all the other time uh, that's available. And, and, and especially the benchmark and the development calls might be something that's worth looking into. So far, it's been from, from what we've seen, of course, it's also a matter of the supply and demand. It's been re really easy uh, for, for those that, that needed to have that access. Do you want to add anything, anything on that? So, actually, already the, the development access modes, we have included a special clause saying that for competent centers and centers of excellence, we can make some special arrangements. I mean, development access normally is for developing codes. But already we have given allocation for you to run some training courses, which is not development, of course. So in, in the same sense, we could discuss with uh, centers of excellence requirements within this context. Still, there has to be some kind of proposal and some kind of technical evaluation that has to go through. But you understand this, this is trivial and typical. Thank you. And, um Question about the security. So BDVA is a member of uh, EuroHPC. And when we talk to industry or especially public sector, data security used to be the barrier to use the systems. Are there any discussions on this direction? Yes, security is a, a main, main discussion point, especially uh, also in the direction of industry. If our industry partners, if you want to have more industry working on our supercomputers, we have to provide them security uh, yeah, standards. And this is something where we work on and we have to work on and uh, this has to provide, of course, to the hosting entities. Okay, I'm going to end our session now. It's exactly four o'clock and I have a punct, a very have to a sharp four o'clock's end. I want to thank everybody for coming this afternoon. I want to thank the quest people who ask questions. I want to big, a big thank you to Prace and the organizers at Prace for helping us make this happen this afternoon. I want to thank our four speakers uh, who are my colleagues and my chair. Uh, and I, we look forward, I think generally, all of us look forward to working with you um, in the future to help build a uh, to a European ecosystem for high-performance computing together. Thank you very much.